everyone. I'm Crystal Contreras, and I'm the director of Inform at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome to today's program, Beyond the Screen, Race and Diversity in Hollywood. If you'd like to ask any of today's experts a question during this program, you can do so in the chat or comment section of the live stream that you're currently watching. The Commonwealth Club has suspended in-person events for the time being, but we're dedicated to keeping you informed during this pandemic. We're going full speed ahead with the full slate of live online programming in 2021. We ask that you consider donating to the club to help us continue our work this year and beyond. Please visit us at commonwealthclub.org slash online to learn more, and you can also click the blue donate button you see on the right side of your screen live during this program. Now, please join me in welcoming Rebecca Sun, Franklin Leonard, Sheldon Lynn, and Linda Yvette Chavez to Inforum. Thank you so much, Crystal. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rebecca Sun. I am Senior Editor of Diversity and Inclusion at The Hollywood Reporter. Welcome to today's virtual program with Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. Today, we're here to discuss the economics of Hollywood, specifically as it pertains to diversity and inclusion and how those factors affect the business of Hollywood. In March, McKinsey released a report that revealed that if the industry addressed racial inequities with respect to black inclusion and representation alone, it could reap an additional $10 billion in annual revenue. And that specific figure might be a surprise, but I think for most of us working in this space, um, the fact that studios and stakeholders are leaving money on the table probably isn't much of a shock. Why that is, is part of what we're here to explore with today's panel of experts. Uh, first of all, we have Linda Yvette Chavez. She is the co-creator, co-showrunner, and executive producer of Netflix's Hentified. She's a Sundance Momentum Fellow and one of Glamour Magazine's top Latinas changing the game for representation in television. Uh, secondly, Franklin Leonard is a film and television producer. Uh, you might know him for, as founder of The Blacklist, which is an annual list featuring Hollywood's most popular yet unproduced screenplays, and which he expanded basically into a, a technology company that... Um, helps screenwriters in the industry. I don't know how else to say it. And finally, Sheldon Lynn is a partner at McKinsey and Company. He's co-author of the report I mentioned, Black Representation in Film and TV, The Challenges and Impact of Increasing Diversity. Uh, before we begin, I just want to remind you guys again that if you'd like to ask us a question, please type it in the chat or comment section. We will try to get through as many of those questions as possible towards the end of this program. I'll leave about 15 minutes for audience Q&A. All right, so uh, let's jump right in. Um, I wanted to start with discussing the McKinsey report a little bit. Franklin, I know that you know you and I, you and I have talked about um, how you know you were sort of involved with the in the group that helped commission that report. Can you tell me a little bit about the genesis of that study? Why, you know, why go to McKinsey for this? Yeah. Um... Well, it really all started, I think it was June 2nd of, of last year, which was sort of blackout Tuesday, right? Um, and I was sitting at home working as I think a lot of us were, um, and you know, occasionally sneaking off to social media to see what was going on in the world. And you know, my social media field sort of filled with black tiles, right? And you know, I, it, initially there was sort of, a, oh, this is a thing. And then very quickly it was like, <laughs> The, these sort of very performative statements on social media, the sort of press releases that silence is complicity, we all have more to do, didn't really square with my experience working in Hollywood over the last 18 years. And I think that, you know, as we've discussed at length, my theory has always been that, that there's a, a sort of moral and ethical component to this lack of representation, but there's also a business one. And that people are leaving a lot of money on the table um, because of these sort of, you know, market uh, sort of perversions. And, you know, I, about two weeks after that, McKinsey sort of came out with, with what I would call their sort of statement in response to the moment. Um, and it included a commitment of $200 million um, in, in pro bono consulting, specifically focused on economic racial equity. Um, I'm an alumni, uh, alumnus of uh, the firm, uh, as, as they say, and, and I, worked, I worked there um, as a business analyst in 2002, 2003. And so I reached back out to some of my colleagues and said, listen, if you're interested in this, um, not only can we address a question specifically of racial equity in the context of Hollywood, but it also has an amplifier effects. And so much of Hollywood is, you know, broadcast 40 feet high on, the, on screens around the world and in screens in our pockets and on our walls. Um, and, and they saw, I think, the same vision that I did, which was 
if we can sort of explicate this world, it may have a ripple effect. And, you know, the rest is history. You know, we worked together for about seven months. I was sort of a representative of an organization called the Black Light Collective, which is an, a number of Black Hollywood folks that are specifically focused on trying to figure out these issues. And, um, you know, here we are less than a year later. Sheldon, I'd love to, um, you know, bring you in for those who haven't yet had a chance to peruse the study and um, it, the, the full report is online and there are various write ups uh, on it. Franklin wrote an excellent one uh, in The New York Times. But Sheldon, can you first um, start, you know, by kind of walking us a little bit through the methodology? You know, uh, what, one thing that struck me about it is that it's both quantitative and a qualitative analysis. Yeah, absolutely, Rebecca. Rebecca and, and thanks for having me. And look, you know, I think, you know, working with Franklin and the Black Light Collective did provide some unique opportunities for us to augment the approach. And just to be fair, quite a bit of work had been done to date in terms of research on the state of diversity in Hollywood by uh, Dr. Hunt at UCLA, Dr. Smith at USC and others. And the thing that we tried to do, you know, we tried to go several clicks below that data as well, but also take this on the perspective of the lived experiences of black professionals trying to enter and navigate and build a career in Hollywood. And that's where some of the more stark findings came about. Uh, if you look at the report, I think we shared a handful of the pain points we found, but in total, I believe we cataloged 45 different pain points that black professionals encountered as they tried to enter and navigate the industry. All the way from getting an internship getting paid for that internship, getting an agent, getting a project option, getting stereotyped on what stories you can tell, to getting um, you know, proper funding for your efforts, to getting recognized in the various awards establishments. So again, the ability to go through the perspective of the lived experience of black professionals was actually quite instrumental to the perspective we're able to land on. Linda, you know, as a creative, I think that um, you must have, or you must at least be very familiar with some of these barriers that people of color face in the industry. You know, Sheldon mentioned the over 40 pain points. And, and one thing I really wanna um, hopefully be able to do uh, throughout our hour today is uh, be able to um, certainly illuminate some of the similarities that all marginalized groups face, but also acknowledge the fact that we're literally talking about a diverse group of people, everybody who isn't, you know, white, male, straight, cisgender, uh, you know, comes from money. In Hollywood, there are also specific barriers that specific communities face. So, you know, maybe Linda, if you don't mind, kind of maybe starting with just the story of getting Pentified, developed, and, um, and and greenlit, and or in general, just throughout your career, what are some of the barriers that systemically, uh, specifically, happen to affect uh, Latino artists and creatives? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, you know, I think it's my experience will be very different, nowhere near that of someone who is black in this industry. I think it's much more. Um, challenging and I have variables that are specific to me and to, to my experience and even within our community, obviously we're a diverse set of people. And so I can only speak to my experience, but what I will say is that uh, living and growing up in the LA area and coming into the industry to uh, pitch on my, my work. Um, I think the the people's idea of what I look like is what often people working for them look like their maids, their gardeners, um, the folks who run their valet. And so I think a lot of what I encountered was a lot of unconscious bias around coming into a space um, and realizing that uh, their experience of someone like me was very limited. It was limited to what they had experienced. And so being able to unpack my experience and talk to folks about things um, in a way that was uh, complex or that they could understand didn't really happen until post Trump, I think it was around that time that we started to develop and take out the Hentify to pitch. And I remember before that, because my, my undergraduate degree is in comparative studies and race and ethnicity. And so I was brought up in my art um, through social protest theater and black and, and brown and Asian, you know, activists and artists. And um, that's a lot of what I bring into my work. And so I knew words like phrases like white privilege, I knew things like that. And I would, anytime I would say that in a room, I mean, the reaction was, you know, like, oof, like it was 
that, you know, this girl is out here trying to make trouble was the, was the feeling. There was also a lot early on for me around uh, bilingual, having content that was bilingual, Spanish and English. Folks were like, Spanish is not marketable. Like you're going between languages, it needs to be all English. Initially, one of the earlier projects I had was where it's about my aunts who were like, old, you know, my mom, my aunts, my grandma, who were all older Latinas, that was also looked down upon as like, well, that's not marketable. Um, and to me, it was like, that's such a huge part of my experience as a, a Latina and as a child of immigrants. Like we come into this world, um, not everyone, I don't speak for everyone, but I'll speak for those that I've grown up with. Like we come into a world of community, like our families, our aunts, our cousins, like we're all up in each other's lives. And so our, our creations like the, as artists, like they come into our work. And um, I think to have folks kind of push back on that, I think it came from uh, folks who perhaps grew up in a culture, also American culture that's very individualistic and very much about leaving home and pulling away from family. And so getting people to understand that didn't quite fully, I didn't walk into a room and didn't feel that, that hesitation until after, you know, Trump came into power four or five years ago. I forget how long I tried to forget that phase. Um, but until then that I would come into a room and use these, these phrases and not feel folks immediately shut down. Like it started to become a, a space in which people were like, okay, this is uncomfortable. I'm going to start to listen. And over the years, I started to see that huge shift as I walked into rooms and, and being able to speak with so much power now as we come in with this, this next season of the show and go into rooms and pitch on other projects. Like I can walk into rooms and not feel as um, worried that my career is going to go nowhere. If I bring up the fact that someone is being biased or I bring up the fact that like, this is my experience and it's valuable. And it may not be to you historically because you didn't put invest in us as creators and artists and in our work so that it could go far historically, but now let's, let's, let's do it. Let's invest in our stories and let's move forward. So I think there, there's a lot, there's a lot there in that many years of, of that trajectory. So. Linda, would you mention, you know, what uh, is marketable or what people choose to invest in, you know, Franklin, from your position as founder of the blacklist, I mean, you interface with a lot of buyers, right? People who are looking for stories and trying to decide, you know, what to develop. Um, can you unpack that common, you know, sort of dismissal that we hear, this is marketable and, you know, what is marketable and what isn't marketable? What are the underlying assumptions you know, behind that judgment and, and what's the actual reality? I, I'd say the first underlying assumption is that the, the folks in aggregate who are making the decision about what is marketable know what is marketable. Um, and there doesn't appear to be a ton of evidence supporting that hypothesis. And, and I'll take it actually outside of diversity for a second, because I actually think that that's almost more relevant to make the case that it's not having anything to do with diversity and diversity is a subset of a broader market failure. You know, the blacklist has existed for 16 years now. And every year we take a survey of, you know, the scripts that the industry loves, but hasn't yet made. Um, and some of those things certainly were, were going to get made, but a lot of them were things that, and, and the writers of the scripts have said this point blank, Chris Terrio about Argo, Kelly Marcella about Saving Mr. Banks. The blacklist is the thing that sort of catalyzed it into existence, right? More people read it, people were willing to take a chance on it. You know, Benedict Cumberbatch said he read The Imitation Game because of the blacklist. What's fascinating to me about that, Harvard Business School did a study three years ago and found that movies made from scripts on the blacklist Controlling for all other factors like budget and who's releasing them and the experience level of the writer make about 90% more in revenue than movies made from scripts not on the blacklist, which sort of goes to the core of this idea that like what the people that are making the financing decisions about what should get made, that, that, that they know better than anybody else, maybe there's a flaw there. Maybe, maybe they don't actually have a great grasp of the market. And then, you know, as we sort of talk about it in terms of, of sort of representation and broader diversity questions, I mean, I think McKinsey's work and I think other work on top of that has validated the fact that, like, there is a massive disconnect between the assumptions that the decision makers are making in the green light meetings about what has value and what audiences want to see and what audiences actually want to see. I mean, one of the things that I was most struck by in the McKinsey study if you look at all the films that have two or more black creatives above the line, 
writer, director, producer. Those films are more likely to get smaller budgets by significant margin, and Sheldon can probably speak to the numbers better than I can, smaller marketing budgets to be distributed in fewer international territories. And despite all of that, those movies still deliver about a 10% higher ROI, and again, Sheldon, correct me if I'm wrong on the numbers, than films with one or fewer black creatives in one of those positions. Now, I, I didn't get my PhD in economics, but as an optimization problem, you would think that you would slide more towards making more of those films and giving more of them fi the financial support so you can claim more of that return on investment than steering away from them and banking on things that historically may do well by whatever standard you've been judging it by, but don't do as well as these other things. Sheldon, you know, McKinsey is known for basically being, I mean, the people who come in and tell you how you've been running your business wrong and, and how to run it correctly. And so, you know, as somebody, as, as a company that is, that is not in Hollywood, that does not work solely in entertainment, I mean, one of the things that struck me about the study uh, another aspect was the fact that C-suites, Hollywood C-suites are actually wider and more male than uh, a number of industries, including like healthcare and heavy industry. And um, like, I don't know, I, I was shocked, you know, because I think that um, we like to market ourselves in the entertainment industry as being at the front line of, you know, progressivism and inclusion. But, you know, the, the C-suite is not the case. What is the advice, I mean, you know, if, if Hollywood, generic Hollywood company X, you know, were to bring in McKinsey as a, con, you know, to consult, I mean, what's the advice here? What, what are they missing and what, what should they be doing about it? Yeah, that's the, I guess, billion dollar question, Rebecca, or maybe it's $10 million. And look, I would start by, you know, saying we should approach this topic with a fair amount of humility. And I would say that broadly across sectors, you're right. We were surprised to find that Hollywood was less diverse at the C-suite than many other, most other American sectors. So that was surprising and it has real consequences because obviously it affects the folks who are trying to make a living in the industry, but also in the perceptions that shapes in terms of what people consume in media. Um, but the solutions, that, and we did document four potential pathways in the report. But, but I do think people should approach these with humility. We're talking about decades of practices, policies, you know, customs and norms that will take some doing to um, unwind. And you know, we've done some companion research, Rebecca, um, on you know, corporate America broadly. And it, depressingly, that report found that it will take 95 years to get to parity, respect to Blacks being represented across all levels and all sectors, not just entry-level jobs, but mid-level jobs, and the C-suite. So this is not just a Hollywood problem. For sure, at the C-suite, the numbers are much more stark than elsewhere, but it's going to take a real commitment to addressing the talent supply at the entry level, progression to management. Um, it's going to take a real thoughtfulness around how we think about the metrics that define how we invest. Franklin talked about it, right? So a lot of these investment protocols are divorced from the market realities. So these are projects that are making a lot more per dollar spent, uh, 16 cents more per dollar spent on marketing. They make more per country, but are shown in 30 to 40 percent fewer countries. So I, I do think, you know, kind of people maturing to taking a, a data perspective on how we allocate resources is going to be a big part of that. Look at those budgets, make sure we are funding projects. And then the other big thought and to your question of what can company X do? We actually have a pretty strong view, and this is specific to uh, film and TV, that will take more than one company. Because again, Hollywood and Franklin and Linda can tell you more than I can, is not really a company, it's an ecosystem. It's a whole value chain that's you know, highly connected. So agencies, unions, guilds, students, networks, financiers, distribution companies, award shows. And for you to be an effective professional, you're going to have to navigate the full spectrum. So no matter how well intended a given company is, solving this problem is going to take some cross-company collaboration. So again, a lot to unpack, a lot to do. Um, and, and you know, we should approach this with the right amount of humility because these are deeply entrenched, long-standing problems. 
That's absolutely uh, right. I'm glad you brought up the, you know, the point about the inc- interconnectedness of the ecosystem. And um, it sort of makes this, this issue a little bit harder to solve, but, um, but we'll get there at the, by the end of this hour, we'll have solved it. Um, you know, there's so much, a lot of times, you know, when we talk about diversity and inclusion with any field, there's this metaphor of a seat at the table, you know, um, who's in the room. But I feel like we are, now moving towards a 2.0 version of that, which is there's a there's a big difference between, you know, just being in the room and being at the head of the table or, you know, being in a position where you don't have to always have your hat in hand. Um, and so I think, Linda, I'd like to start with you with with this question, which is, you know, what are some of the other more subtle uh factors in terms of, you know, if you're a, an, a creative or an executive of color or a, from some marginalized background, what, what else do we need to be looking for other than just, oh, I was hired? You know, uh, I, I want to ask about budgets. You know, do you feel like your show or shows like it, you know, are, are getting enough production spend? Are they getting enough marketing spend? How are they being marketed? What are all of these subtle factors that that all add up to actually getting the same shot that um, Friends does or whatever? I picked a <laughs> red <red-line> show. <laughs> <laughs> the random white show. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I can't speak too much in detail, but I, I do feel like in general, when you, you know, we all talk to each other, obviously all these, all creators of color and, and showrunners of color and folks who are out here trying to change this industry. We're all in conversation constantly about the things that need to change in the industry. And I think one of the big things is um, that investment in our work that goes beyond um that goes beyond is equal to what other shows have that are white historically would get both in production funds and in marketing funds. And I think that, um, that investment and also that an understanding that like, that it's going to take time. I think often there's this, this idea that like, Oh, it didn't perform well moving on and, and, and let's not do more of these types of shows. I think folks are starting to come out of that, but the reality is it, it's something that I've been thinking about for a few weeks. Cause I was on a, a panel with Stephen Canals like a few weeks ago. Um, and he mentioned there was something he had said and I'm forgetting right now what it was, but it triggered for me this, this thought around just how we don't view Hollywood in the same way that we view our country as an institution that has been, you know, that has been rooted in white supremacy for so long that they, they've, they've caused severe damage to our communities and how Hollywood as an institution through the media representation that it's had for many, many, many years has caused severe damage to our communities. And in order to rectify that and come back around from that, there needs to be an investment that initially may not seem like the right business move, but is really in a lot of ways making up for the damage that has been done for many years. I'm still kind of circling what this is because I think because it's a business, we don't really, we don't hold the same account. We don't ask for the equal accountability or ask for it our shows to be allowed to be it's almost like we're owed a diversity of shows just because like whether or not it makes you money or (laughs) or whether or not gives you numbers doesn't matter like we are deserving of that um equality so that we can get to i guess 95 years from now (laughs) we find something equal um but i think that there there needs to be deeper thought put into that and not just like, well, those things don't perform well. It's like, well, why? And like, let's study like ultimately what it is. It may be that what traditionally your algorithm does for one show is not going to do for this one, because when it's shown to certain people, their unconscious bias about the people they're seeing on screen affects whether or not they're going to click on it. It's not just whether or not they see the image. It's what they have historically seen these people as. So maybe they're not going to click through because of that. So what are we doing to adjust for that? What are we doing to um, see those differences? So I don't, again, I don't know. I'm not a researcher. I'm grateful for, for those here who are and the work that they're doing. And, um, but I think that there's just a lot to it that we're, we're putting so much on creators to, to like kind of carry the worth of our content um, in this way when it really should be on the institution who has created the problem, I think. Again, still circling the thought. I may be wrong. <laughs> Go ahead, Franklin. 
Yeah, I just wanted to sort of um, emphasize a few of the things that, that Linda said. I, you know, I think that Hollywood does need to grapple with sort of its historical role in a lot of the things that it will publicly decry now. You know, I'm always struck by the fact that Hollywood's first ever blockbuster was Birth of a Nation, right? The D.W. Griffith film that literally gave the Klan the hooded robes and the, the burning uh, cross and really led to its resurgence. And it certainly cemented the notion of sort of black male criminality um, in, in white America's consciousness. And you still see elements of that, you know, over time in the movies that Hollywood makes. You know, there was a study, Vox did a study in 2011 that found that 60 percent of gang members on screen in American movies are black but only 30% says the FBI are black, right? Um, and so when we're, you know, when I walk down the street and, per, and perceived as a criminal threat, like I'm not saying it's a direct correlation, but it, it's hard to argue that they're not, you know, that there's not some connection between the two. And I think the same thing is true of, of the Latinx community. There was a period where 50% of the Latinx immigrants shown on television were shown engaged in some criminal activity, right? <laughs> and meanwhile, you have folks at, at Trump rallies chant, build the wall, they don't know anybody that's a Latinx immigrant, but why do they make these assumptions, right? Um, and so I think that we have to grapple with sort of the consequences of that. And that's part of the reason for the change. And it's funny because Linda, you're right. We probably should be getting that change regardless, just because. But what I love about what the McKinsey study shows is that guess what? You can do well by doing good and vice versa. Right. Um, and so you really don't have an excuse not to like you have to be really committed to not putting us in positions to create and tell our own stories. And we, we can you know, draw conclusions as to why that is to justify giving up money and having a demonstrably negative effect on the material lives of people of, in our communities. And that's sort of, for me, just the, the, the brass tacks of it all. The other thing I'd say about, you know, what, where do we need to go? You know, I, I don't know whose analogy it is, but someone said like, you know, it's one thing to be invited to the party. It's another thing to be invited to play your own music. But there's also another thing to be the person who's doing the inviting. And it's, an, it's another thing still to be deciding what is this event going to be? How is it going to be organized? Is it going to be a potluck, right? Like what time is it starting? Are we going to play music at all? Like, are we going to cycle through a bunch of different types of music? And I think we as an industry would benefit profoundly from being the place where that was the case about everybody. Because what I see on the ground, um, sort of just working in the industry, but I also see as a movie fan is my life is enriched. The industry is enriched by having as many disparate voices as possible contributing to the stories that we tell in aggregate. Because I don't need every movie to ha have somebody that looks like me, right? Like I love The Favorite. They didn't need Franklin Leonard in The Favorite. But I do want a black filmmaker or a Latina filmmaker who wants to make their version of The Favorite to get the same budget and the same support that The Favorite got when it was a great movie. And I don't think that anybody could compellingly argue that we're in that position right now. Absolutely. I'm glad that you mentioned that. I mean, I think that ultimately you want to be at the top of the food chain, you know, or, you know, if we were going to use that, that analogy. And, and, that, and that's another thing that I think is important is I'm, I'm really heartened to see that a lot of the conversation around inclusion in the industry is moving, expanding beyond, you know, putting the onus on artists and creatives to, to really talking about how do we get these networks and studios and agencies, you know, uh, to be more, you know, well represented and, and fully representative. Um, you know, Sheldon, you interviewed, um, a, a, a enormous quantity of people anonymously, you know, uh, black, you know, executives, um, other folks working in Hollywood. What were some of the things that they shared with you that really struck you the most about what um, their experiences is like? Maybe we can say we can use the phrase pain points uh, yeah. as you did, but what's keeping them from moving up and becoming, you know, the head of the studio? Yeah, and again, you know, there are a lot of obstacles, uh, a great many. And, you know, the reality is that, and just to be clear, Rebecca, we, we spoke to, you know, in, in depth, 50 professionals working in various capacities in the industry. Um, you know, some were Black, some were not. And we all obviously had the benefit of interacting with the Black Life Collective more broadly. And the pain points were, you know, quite, quite varied, starting with, and this was actually revealed to us by somebody who was not Black. 
how you get into the industry. And he was recanting almost embarrassingly, you know, kind of about how he got in. He said, I got in because I attended Harvard and my future employer sent an email to the arts clubs at Stanford, Harvard, and Princeton. And that's how I got uh, informed about the job. And then when I got the job, he said, okay, great, you got the job, but it's going to be an unpaid internship or very close to it. So right off the bat, what seemed to be well-intended at the start, basically in, in, two, in the first two steps was in excluding a large swath of the population based on the schools you went to or didn't go to, based on your ability to take a job that wouldn't pay. So the, the, the first obstacle is at entry. And then it comes to how do you get an agent, getting representation? There's this kind of vicious cycle where you're having trouble getting an agent because the agent is saying that, you know, your creative output may not sell. And the student is saying, well, I would love to put more underrepresented folks in this project, but I can't find anyone, right? So you have all these problems and ultimately end up with this massive market failure, which, you know, and we were very deliberate, Rebecca, about taking the business lens, right? So, you know, Linda talked about some of the moral imperatives. Uh, Frankie talked a bit about for the art form, right? So what is we missing if we'd allow the best creatives, regardless of background, to enter the industry? But the reality is that, you know, if you, if you think about the, you know, the fact that only 4% of the projects coming from Hollywood are accounted for by black off-screen creatives, so writers, directors, producers. Keep in mind, the population average is 13%, 13.4% to be specific. That's a massive loss in the art form because for every Jordan Peele we have, for, we're missing two or three more. Every Shonda Rhimes missing two or three more, right? So there's a whole question of this market failure where we've kept out of the industry the most talented people because of all these barriers. And it, it goes all the way throughout. It goes to getting funding for the projects. Franken alluded to this, but the numbers are quite stark. First, Black creatives get funneled to race-related content. So biopics, dramas, and where race is essential to the, to the picture. And those pictures get you know, one-third the funding of let's say a race agnostic picture, think Avengers, think you know, other projects, uh, 007. And you know, when it comes to marketing, severely underfunded, right? And it's hard to separate these choices from the people making the decisions, who is in the marketing department, who sits in the executive suites. So again, a, a number of barriers that make it difficult to enter, to get an agent, to get projects, to get those projects funded, to get recognized on the back end in terms of award shows, and you know, quite heartbreaking, to be honest with you, in terms of listening to these stories. And the, the final point I'll, I'll make, Rebecca, because this is kind of instructive for the path forward, is a fear of retaliation. So all the folks we spoke to wanted to remain anonymous for fear of retribution or for being typecast by association with this, this, this specific topic, which again, you know, we have folks who are working every day with peers and can't really bring their full selves to, to these interactions. So obviously, you know, quite, quite heartbreaking and sobering. If, if I could just jump in and add one thing, because I don't want Linda to have to. One of the things that I'm actually most interested about from the McKinsey study and sort of what other future work exists there is that $10 billion in annual revenue is specifically and only the sort of, you know, potential windfall for addressing anti-Black sort of bias, right? That doesn't even get into anti-Latinx. And notably, the numbers are, I believe, as a sort of proportion of population, even worse in that community right now. We still have gross underrepresentation of all women, of the LGBTQ community, of the disabled community. I sit and sort of muse about what, that, what the number is in aggregate. If it's 10 billion just for black folks, what is the aggregate number of sort of money that there is to be claimed by having a Hollywood that actually looks like the country of the world? And instead, and this is an analogy that I've been playing with, I don't know exactly how accurate it is, but I think it sort of communicates the idea. You know, Hollywood is up to now largely functioned as though they were the owner of a professional basketball team who only signed people to the roster who were known personally to the owner of the team or their personal network. And I think if that's how you're 
putting together your roster of an NBA team, you're going to get beat by most of the other NBA teams that are going out and finding, you know, Giannis Adetokounmpo, um, you know, out of Greece or LeBron out of out of um, Akron and putting together the team of the best possible talents. And and I look forward to as a viewer and also a sort of member of the industry, an industry where the best possible talents are sort of being discovered and received the support that they need selfishly so I can just watch the things that they make. Um, and I think we'll all be better off when the best talent has the most resources and we can then all sort of live in a culture that's populated by that instead of the sort of weirdly guided by a colonial legacy sort of structure that we have up to now. Uh, yes, I'm glad you mentioned that, Franklin. And, and particularly, I think, I mean, as of the last time I checked, which was pre-pandemic, I mean, L Latino movie-going audience over indexes, right, in terms of their proportion to the population. And I believe that uh, Latinos remain the most disproportionately underrepresented demographic in Hollywood in terms of their population. I mean, even if you just looked at, like, Los Angeles alone, right, mm -hmm. it's, it's yeah. insane. So, um, so, so for sure, you could only speculate as to, or, or we can just commission Sheldon right now to, to do a report about every other, um, you know, uh, racial group to, to see how much more money is, is being lost. Um, I kind of wanted to just throw, this is something that I've been thinking about a, a little bit too, which is, you know, again, $10 billion has been this headline figure ever since the McKinsey report came out. Um, but the fact that there is some sort of money being lost is is not so much a surprise to most people who have been sort of halfway paying attention to this conversation for the past several years. Right. We, you've heard like every like when Black Panther came out, it was like, you know, the, the studio heads were like diversity is good for business. And then Crazy Rich Asians came out. Guess what, guys? Diversity is good for business. And, you know, like how many more times do you have to say it? Is there something more compelling? And um, I don't know if any of you want to comment on this, but I'll just say I, I was having a conversation with uh, a, a black TV writer that I will keep anonymous for her own safety. But, you know, she was like white Trump's green, basically. You know, what's more compelling than money? Is it power? Is it the ability to retain control? So is there something that we can say to sort of like, I don't know, like to kind of take away the scariness of perhaps like not being in control of everything, you know, if, if money isn't going to compel it, can we like make it a little less scary to say like, hey, if you share a little, if you, if you share a little bit of this, like we promise you, you're not going to be like kicked out of the industry. I mean, I'm just a journalist, but you guys who are a little bit more in it, like just say something to convince the people who don't want to give up their power. Well, so I don't know if I can speak to that question of, you know, convincing or you know, kind of giving comfort to folks who are afraid of losing power. But I, I will say it's a quite remarkable market failure. You're right. This is a well-established, you know, quintessential American industry over 100 years old that, you know, many of these companies are conglomerates listed in the public markets, public capital markets, that it is surprising to find these market failures. And the data does back it up that these are indeed market failures. There's no other way to explain the fact that only 4% of projects are black-led. Same kind of you know, underrepresentation. We look at Latinx. The fact that they are, we're underfunding with respect to ROI, return investment. The fact that we're not placing these projects in the markets where they can sell. So there's a, a, a massive market failure. But the thing I might say is this. As a potential way forward, you can, and I, I like the fact that Franklin brought up the sports analog. It's as if, again, you know, if you're at a top college football, you know, university, these folks have scouts in the 50 states and all territories. You name, you know, any part of the country where there's a talented football player in high school, freshman, sophomore, that person will be found. And it's really for the competitive edge, right? It's for the competitive edge. So who are we missing? If we're in the industry as a top of a studio, who is that next great running back or wide receiver that we're missing because we only went to New York and LA? But this person may be in Georgia, in Louisiana, in Tennessee. So maybe that's a path forward to give some comfort that says, look, for the competitive spirit that we know you all have, there are remarkable creatives out there. They just don't happen 
to live in New York or LA or go to the handful of schools you recruit at. They are HBCUs, they are two-year colleges, they live in these places. Take a page from the playbook of the college football you know, uh, schools where they will literally go anywhere in the name of finding the best talent to put on the field on Saturday. So again, maybe that's a way forward. Go ahead, yeah. Franklin. I think, I think that's right fundamentally. And I also, look, I think there's two things. One, you know, for years, I've, I've been in the industry for 18 years now, and I've, I've been part of these conversations where people talk about like, well, we want to do this. We, we want to, to figure this diversity thing out. We know that it's bad that this has been the case, right? But it's, a, it's, a, it's risky, right? Like changing our business model, changing our approach. Like we're a business. We're a for-profit entity. In, in, in America, that's just the nature of, of arts. It's capitalism. And I think that what we can say now, and, and part of the reason why I wanted to specifically to reach out to McKenzie was is, Okay, that question is answered. We, we know that it is it possibly not risky, possibly the opposite of risky. Continuing to do what you've been doing is actually the risky thing, you know, financially. So let's find out, is white more powerful than green? You know, we have the information now to make the argument that green should at least be balanced, if not a little bit heavier, from the experts, the people that you guys pay to tell you, to, you know, to solve business problems for you, Let's find out. And I think the other thing is, is like, let's say even for you, it is. White's more powerful than green. Well, I can promise you that some people are going to make a different call. And if McKinsey's study is right, they're going to continue to deliver better business outcomes, which will render you a smaller and smaller part of the market share until you're rendered completely obsolete. So, it's, it, it, I guess my question to people sort of who have the power to make those decisions is, do you feel lucky? Do you think that you can continue to run your businesses as poorly as you have up to now and expect to continue to be in the chairs that you're in? Because other people aren't going to and they're going to find success. Um, and, and again, also better movies, more money for everyone, um, you know, and I think that that, I think that should be a future we can all be happy about. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I can speak again to the research side of things, but I will say on, on the other side of that, and I agree with everything that everyone's saying, um, I think within our communities, we're trying our best to amass power ourselves and, and not waiting for people to give it to us, um, but like demanding it and saying like, this is, I'm here and, and, um, building that power so that we can then um, bring folks who are coming up through the ranks. Cause the more that we kind of push to be into and come into positions of power, uh, the more power we have to hire people who need that um, door opened. I think you mentioned earlier, Sheldon, like the guy from Harvard and like the connections he had, I don't know the number of white people I've met who are like, my godfather is, I don't know, some famous white person. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's cool. cool, cool, cool. Um, but for me, I knew no, I'm from LA. I knew nobody in the industry, my entire family. Like I come from a family of immigrants from Mexico. I knew no one. And so for me coming up through this industry is one is I am not a fan of these types of power dynamics, but I do feel like this is the industry we're working in. And so amassing that power so that I have the ability to, um, open doors for the folks who I know may not otherwise be seen if not for someone like me in the position to see them. And it's happened so many times already where um, folks who wouldn't normally not be their talent or their abilities maybe are different from how you would traditionally um, conduct business in this industry or you, your background, you don't even have a college degree. You came up from Englewood, you came up from Linwood. I don't know, but to have someone like myself or, or someone who understands them to be able to see them and to mentor or support them through this industry, because I think retention is another piece of the puzzle. Like we're asking for more and more, which is beautiful. Now we need more and more people to fill these, these holes of, um, because that the, the call for diversity and inclusion is big. And so folks want more people in there and, and are finding like not enough folks with enough experience or things like that. But we don't have very strong foundation or structure infrastructure for retention in our communities. I think there's many of us who are trying to do it, um, trying to do the work of the blacklist. Like so many folks are trying to do the work 
um, of mentorship and creating that infrastructure, but I think it has to be much bigger and much more um, experience-based. I think there's so many things Marvin, my co-creator on the show, is um, speaks on these diversity programs that will put you through a program but won't give you a directing gig. Like, they won't give you a job. Like, there's such a big part of this industry is experience. And, you know, being someone who hires directors, uh, production designers, costume designers, all these things, I will tell you with complete um, transparency that if you don't have a billion credits it is so hard to get you through the door, not only with a network, but with a union, like, and you can have very talented people, but, but the barrier to get in and to get into those positions is huge. And you need someone in a position of power to strongly advocate and basically take um, the risk, take the risk to hire you and say, no, I'm going to, I'm going to advocate for the, this person and get them through. Um, and that's why, letting go of power, I think is important because you may not see with what we are going to be able to see and why not, not live from a place of scarcity and believe that you're going to be okay. You're still going to have some power. Let me just share it with some few other people. Like it's going to be fine. You will survive. And I think that within our communities, I think we're finding that we're building community that way, not living from a place of scarcity and saying there's enough for all of us and let's lift each other up. Um, and I think that if you're white, whatever it is, like, think of it that way that the things will not be taken away from you. It's only going to um, make things better. Like Franklin said, like all of the, the financially, the, whatever it may be, it's only going to lift you up. So, yeah. That's a perfect segue to the, the last question I wanted to ask um, before we transition to audience Q and a, which is, you know, I think, for a long time, it probably felt like you were the only one, you know, we were all the only one trying to just, you know, facing a, just a, a wall of white, you know, and, and trying to get in. And, but now um, let's talk a little bit about community building, coalition building and allyship and, and how that I, I do believe is, uh, is the way in which, in which we'll, we'll reach that sort of ideal, that, that ideal of parity and equity. Um, again, every community is, is very different. We've started in different places. Um, we have different compositions. Um, you know, I, I did a story recently um, specifically about uh, how Asians in Hollywood have have sort of been been working on this a little bit over the past few years. But um, I'd like to hear, you know, Linda, specifically with um, Latinos. I've had conversation with with different Latinos working in the industry about some of the very specific barriers that they face um, to, to coalition building. I think that speaking as the Asian delegate, we've, we've really looked to uh, Black Hollywood as, as a model for how they've been able to build solidarity um, with, with one another, but knowing that there's still a lot of room to go. Um, can you give us a quick summary? <laughs> speak for the group, uh, you know, but just a little speak from for your, all the people. <laughs> speak for everybody. Uh, no, only from your vantage point. You know, you already talked a lot. Uh, you already began to speak about those those specific barriers. But what is the state of things for you know when we're talking about what's missing? What do we need more of? What's working really really well? You know, what 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 do you need from other allies? You know, other other demographics, other people groups in the industry, and let's kind of. Uh, and and this portion of the panel talking about the 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 coalition. Yeah, I mean, I think it's that's a tough question for I think the Latinx community because we are not we're we are not a race. We we have within our our community Black, Asian, Indigenous folks who have historically been severely underrepresented and often in our industry those who do make it to the top are the folks who are either light skin or white passing or are economically more, uh, have grown up in a much more, uh, financially stable home more money had more connections, uh, uh, status, immigration status comes to play as well in terms of what opportunities you had when you came to this country, whether or not the country of origin was something that was a pleasant thing to the government at the time or not, um, that all affects things. Also our history in different parts of the country, Chicanos in the South West had a much different history in this country than say like Cubans in Miami or Puerto Ricans in New York. And within our communities, we have such diverse like ethnic makeup. So I think within our community, we're still figuring ourselves out and figuring out what is the thing that really 
unifies us. And in a lot of ways, I do think that acknowledging those truths within our community is what's going to strengthen our ability to get the representation we need. Like I said earlier, my roots academically are, are, you know, grounded in like first and foremost, black liberation is what's most important because your proximity to whiteness will not save you. It's never saved any of us and never will. And so that should always be the thing that we're working towards because ultimately, you know, that freedom will lead to so many others freedom freedom. And so for me, it's, it's trying to speak from our specific perspective and, and, and find acknowledging that as a community, I think that's the conversations that we're having. And, and I'm grateful to like Afro Latinx and indigenous Latinx folks. And those who don't identify as Latinx from these communities who are leading the charge and uh, helping us stay accountable and to having those discussions. Cause I, I'll be honest for a very long time. I didn't identify as Latina after college. I identified as Chicana with Konekis, with an X, which acknowledges my indigenous and ancestry because of the complexities of that term. And I think that, <laughs> I think we're coming this past year as a community, we're coming into like, why can't we get it together? Why are we, why is our representation not there? What's going on? And often it leads to like comparisons to the black community or other communities that like is not um, productive for that representation. And, and I don't know how, I don't have the specific answer, but I do know that we're building community and we're having those conversations and we're trying to figure it out and it's not going to be perfect, but I will say that the communities that I've been participating in as of late has, have been so it's, it's made it to, so that we're not so lonely in this game. Like I'm part of a, a group called entitled Latinx project, which is all these Latina, um, Latin, Latine, like uh, showrunner creators and um, high level writers. And they're doing a lot of great work. We did great work with the, the blacklist with the Latinx TV list. And, and they have been such a resource for these moments where, you know, goes down in those closed rooms that you're just like, you need to, so, to tell somebody, Hey, this happened. And then to have that conversation, how you get through it, how do we support each other through it? How do we hold each other accountable? How do we talk to other communities and how do we build coalitions? I think, I think it's important. It's important for us to have those discussions, but I do feel it. And I do feel like a huge difference from now to before where there was this, the term that everyone uses crabs in a barrel mentality of like, there's only one opportunity so screw you like i'm gonna go get it uh now it's very much like no like we need to support each other and lift each other up and and try to f- lead from a place of love with each other and and conversation so um i i think it's good i think we're i think we're gonna get there in 95 years sorry that number for me was like i'm gonna be gone by then but i can't wait yeah i, I just i would just echo all of that i think look for me it's really just about finding other people who share with you the fundamental value that like, it's not a party till everybody gets there. Um, Just to go back to the party analogy again, like obviously I'm engaged with members of the black community. Black Light Collective is one example. You know, that's how we connected with Sheldon and McKenzie, but the blacklist is also doing work with the Untitled Latinx project to do the Latinx list. We're doing the disability list, the GLAD list, because again, everybody is better off when everybody is represented in the culture. It's just, a, it's a fundamental belief of mine and every study I've ever read contributes to that idea, right? Even if you go back to like farming, you wanna rotate your crops because um, eventually you're just gonna leach the soil and it's not gonna, like, the food's not gonna grow and it's not gonna be interesting anymore, right? That This is a pattern that exists throughout existence. And so for me, it's just finding the people that share that fundamental value and finding ways that we can work together to make a bigger pie for everybody. And fortunately or unfortunately, there's been such a market failure for so long that right now we can build a bigger pie that allows everybody more access and everybody benefits from it. Not just black Hollywood, not Latinx Hollywood, not white Hollywood, literally everyone. And that for me is the goal. We've got some, uh, I'm very impressed by this Commonwealth club uh, audience. There's, there's some really good questions here. Um, Let me start with one that talks about that entry level pain point. Uh, It seems that the entertainment industry has some of the lowest paying entry level jobs of all industries, which, you know, obviously then has a lot of uh, correlations to keeping uh, BIPOC people out of being able to even start a career when you don't come from institutional family wealth. How can this be remedied? Um, Let me start with Sheldon, but anybody can jump in and, you know, what do we do? About yeah, and again, this is a big one. And, and you know, you, you might say it came out of um, good intent. Hey, you know, 
this this job is open to everyone. You know, as a matter of fact, it's un, it, it's free, right? It's unpaid. And you know, when you unpack it, and we've done research, not just us, you know, where we see that, for example, the average black household has one tenth the the wealth of a you know white household. So it, these dollars do matter. And and most um, folks, um, you know, are first generation graduates, like black folks. And your first job is thinking about, you know, how do I pay student loans? How do I help family members? So the option to take a low paying job doesn't, is, is not really viable. And so, you know, there are things that, you know, to the point of cross company collaboration, there are things that the industry can do and others have done, not to say they're beacon, but in finance, for example, there are higher standards for pay in tech. It's a war for talent and they're recruiting interns, freshmen, sophomore, and they're paying at you know, market levels to ensure that they outcompete others. And I think it's going to take a, a cross company view that says, look, we want the best talent in this industry. And for that, we have to take people who independent of their financial background. Therefore, let's set some threshold for what a living wage looks like at entry level, but also for interns. And you know, think about accommodations. So I would say this is something that industry can take on to set some threshold to create a living wage for people early on so you can you know, open up access to folks regardless of their financial background. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think the other thing that the industry has to sort of seriously consider is that look, there's always been this assumption that all of these entry level jobs are sort of fundamentally apprenticeships, right? There's no skill that you have prior to getting them that is necessarily going to give you an advantage. The, the, the assumption is, right, we don't know who's going to be talented. So we'll just hire the people that we know and then train them up and they can prove themselves. And so I think that the, if we're going to have a conversation about a threshold of, of pay, there also needs to be a reckoning with what are the skills, like the real skills that sort of predict success in this business? And, and are we actually testing for those skills when we do the interview process? Because again, I, just based on my own personal experience, oftentimes what you're being interviewed for at the assistant level, even at the junior executive level, is not necessarily correlated with the success that you're going to have in the job. And I would even argue that the success you have as an assistant, given the way the assistant job is constructed, is not necessarily predictive of how you're going to do as a junior executive or a mid-level or a senior executive. And we need to think about that talent pipeline and how the labor market is structured in terms of talent um, alongside sort of how we're recruiting and what, what the compensation uh, level is. That's brilliant. Those are such good points. I mean, I think if especially if the entertainment industry considers the fact that they're lo literally losing the competition of, of young, bright talent to to finance, to tech, to all these other fields in which they're actually, um, you know, uh, taking, you know, testing for the best and brightest that should incentivize them a little bit. Um, Let's see, Franklin, let me stay with you, Franklin. Uh, you recommended in, in, in your t New York Times op-ed that executive compensation should be tied to uh, you know, efforts to uh, an exec's success in their efforts to boost diversity. And this uh, listener is wondering if you could expand a little bit on, on what that might look like, what, what such a model might look like. Yeah, well, I, I actually, so I, I think that one of the, this is actually something that came sort of inspired by the McKinsey uh, report. I'm not necessarily saying that every company should tie compensation or bonuses to how diverse is your team. What I am saying though, is, is that if you believe and as you've publicly stated that diversity is a fundamental value. We believe that diversity results in positive business outcomes. Surely it would be reasonable when compensating your employees if you believe that business outcomes are in part caused by diversity to test for the diversity as a way of assessing how those business outcomes are going. I would also argue that, it, you know, compensation should be tied a little bit more closely to actual success in the marketplace controlling for the fit, the market failures that exist around diversity. Right? So, you know, we know what those numbers are now. We know the limitations that those, uh, that those sort of folks have, if you're doing, better than your colleagues with those additional obstacles, maybe you should be compensated significantly more than your colleagues. And let's see what you can do with that support going forward, because we know that even, you know, at altitude, your times are better than your peers running at sea level. Um, so again, I don't know exactly how to construct that, but I do know that there's a way to talk realistically about what are the numbers in practice? What are our stated values? Do those numbers and those stated values match up when it comes to things like hiring and compensation? And again, if you align them correctly, you should get better business outcomes anyway. 
That's beautiful. I mean, I think that uh, that makes sense. I, I, I'm also not a biz. I'm not a business person at all. But, you know, I feel like there should be something to like being penalized for unrealized profit potential, uh, especially if the numbers are now like out there for everybody to see. Uh, just curious as a follow up, Sheldon, is that it, does that sort of um, compensation model exist anywhere in other industries or uh, other companies where you can yeah. sort of legally For sure, Becca. And it's still very early days yet. I think we're in a, a bit of a new paradigm around progress for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And there are a handful of companies in professional services that I know of that have started to tie executive compensation to specific achievement on DNI metrics. So there are a handful of examples of companies starting to experiment at least with ensuring that if we do believe in diversity and inclusion for the business benefits, but also in a way that we believe is, you know, morally right and good, how do we ensure that we are aligning incentives so people make those decisions that create better outcomes? Um, it's, it's really amazing how a lot of the, some of the reckoning, I mean, just thinking as a journalist in media world, we had a few media reckonings uh, after last summer and they came as a direct result of a company like posting a black square. Like we were like, oh, you want to go there? Let's go there. Uh, so yeah, you're right. If, if you're going to be performative, then you got to perform. Um, uh, here's another question, which is uh, if we're talking about an allocation of investing in BIPOC entertainment, I guess, or BIPOC creators entertainment, uh, one person wonders, do you think maybe the government needs to provide funds or incentives? Should, in other words, should you know, public money get involved in some way in this enterprise? I, so you may be able to speak to sort of this better than I can. I, I, the honest answer is I don't know. And, and the honest answer is, is that I don't really care where the money comes from. Um, but I do know that there's an, a massive uh, business opportunity for whoever wants to invest in those projects. And it's not charity. Um, and, and I think that's probably the reason why I'm resistant to the notion of the need for government funding. Um, whoever, whosoever invests heavily in BIPOC, Black, Latinx, Asian, LGBTQ, disabled content, however you want to describe it, is going to, and, and again, the McKinsey study sort of suggests this, find better business outcomes than the folks who are not. So um, sure, if the government wants to structure a fund that will allow for a steady, substantial amount of money to be available for filmmakers to make great movies and television, Absolutely. I'm in favor of that. I'm more in favor of people who have access to those level of resources saying, you know what, let me build a business to make the best things possible and, you know, add a profit motive behind that money so we can make great movies, great television, distribute it widely, market it well, win awards and make lots of money. Yeah, I, you know, for sure, Franklin. And look, you know, my take is that there will always be a role for the government in funding you know, let's say endowment for the arts, right? Uh, in, in particular places where it's not economically viable, but there is some public good. And that has happened, you know, there are numerous examples for that. I think this case is different. You know, we're, we're saying that it is economically viable to fund these projects in a way that would represent the full population, right? So, um, you know, I, I don't think that government funding is a solution here. Obviously, various, you know, state governments have done things around tax incentives that, you know, probably can help get the flywheel in motion. Yeah. But we believe that it's a, there's a business case that this should be self-funding. And in that sense, much less of a need for the government to be involved, at least economically. Yeah, I was just going to add, like, I, I feel like it becomes a slippery slope where you have something like diversity higher type of programs where a, a studio network like is like, oh, we got some money, let's put them here, but are not actually actively looking inwards into like, how are we actually fostering and bringing up these folks in the industry and how are we valuing them and their work? We're saying that they're only as valuable as the money that we're being given to hire them. And that's it. They're just a commodity in that way. And it doesn't matter. Whereas, and I think that's the charity part that, that Franklin's speaking to where it's like, no, like if we give it, give it to the governments, like we're still, we're taking the accountability away from the folks who really have the responsibility to do it and to use their funds. And quite frankly, these folks have lots of money. Like they have lots of, they have plenty of money to invest in all these things. So, you know, sometimes I, I laugh at that, at that because, you know, when you ultimately hear the, the amount of money that, that these students networks may or have, like it's, it's not really, 
it's available when it feels like it's valuable to them to invest. And I think there's a fundamentally something there that's telling them we're not valuable. And, and there's studies telling you that there are. So where, where, where is that coming from? And that's the bigger question. And if you take that away from them to have to face and, and have responsibility to, I don't think it's doing the work that we need it to do ultimately. But, but agree with like, if the government wants to give us money, sure, we'll take it. But like, I, I don't think it's like, uh, I don't think it's the answer really. That's a good question. And these are really thoughtful answers. Um, I want to ask one last question before we do the, the classic inforum question. But before that, uh, here's a micro question, just because this is this should be a pretty quick, easy yes or no. Uh, someone w- wants to know, Sheldon, um, you know, your report obviously focused on um, black participation and inclusion in the industry. They're just curious about the statistics. Uh, do If you might happen to know offhand for for Asian American uh, community in the industry. I don't know if you would happen to know. Yeah. And look, you know, we deliberately focus on one specific group with a perspective that, you know, the issues are specific in terms of where people live, um, barriers they need to overcome. That said, the work needs to be done for all underrepresented groups. You know, as Franklin said, it's not a party until everyone has a drum. And our sense just cursorily was that, you know, there is more underrepresentation in among Asian Americans, but we did not look at that specifically, but that is work that we would recommend get done. Yeah, and, and offhand, I think um, it, it's a little bit different because of proportion. Um, Asian Americans are a much smaller proportion of the, of the overall US population. And so there are fewer of us in the industry, but it's a, a little bit less disproportionate, um, but there can always be more. Um, okay, this is the last question before the 60 second idea. And I really love this one because this is for people who care about this issue. They don't work at the industry, in the industry or related to the industry at all. How can or how should the average moviegoer uh, or entertainment consumer help with these issues they don't have we don't have the money to help finance films is it just simple as just buy a ticket to diverse films is there anything more that people can do i mean speaking as someone who works in the industry uh watch as many good movies and television shows as you possibly can and tell as many people as you can about those good movies and television shows um and i genuinely do mean that because i think that if you are looking for the best things out there the mix of the best things if you go looking for them put aside how much they're marketed, put aside whether they're on like the first thing that comes up on your uh, streaming platform, go to Metacritic, go to Rotten Tomatoes, find critics who have tastes similar to yours. And when they say, there's this little film out of South Korea by a director named Bong Joon-ho, it's called Parasite, you should check it out. Check it out. You might find that it might be one of the best movies of the last decade and you're gonna wanna tell literally everyone you know about how great this movie is. And that is honestly, Part of why the economic realities are the way they are in the business in terms of a lot of these films overperforming, because these communities are talking amongst themselves and saying, hey, we should we should go watch this. It's really good. And then everybody takes that sort of in-group advice and goes and checks it out. Um, So I think the more we can sort of spread the good news of good work uh, and consume it and, and, you know, this is unfortunate reality pay for it if you can if it's easy to do so and you have the money um instead of uh pirating it that's honestly the be- the best thing that consumers can do because that will continue to make the economic case that this is what audiences actually want to see um and again we, we have numbers that validate it but let's just keep reminding them over and over and over again until they get the message or until they cease to exist if you're watching on Netflix, binge the whole thing the first weekend <laughs> and tell everyone you know, because those numbers are so vital and important to the success of your favorites. Like sometimes you'll put it off and like six months later, you're like, oh, let me finish this show. It really, those early numbers are really important. And I think that, um, you know, the word of mouth and, and really making it, if you can, I, I don't know if this is a thing, but helping folks who don't have access to have access. Cause there's, there's a lot of shows that are on, um, you know, paywall subscriber like sites that like aren't succeeding because the communities that would normally um, watch them don't have the money to pay for 20 different streamer um, paywalls. They have Netflix or they have one other thing, something uh, one of our, our department head for hair um, told me last year that she, she's from Guam and she went to Guam and she's like, Oh my God, hint the fight's huge in Guam. And I was like, what? And she's like, everyone I told was like, Oh my God, I love that show. You worked on it. 
And she's like, but you know, I was like, we didn't see, they didn't tell us anything about that in the numbers. She's like, oh, you know, Guan, well, you know, everyone shares passwords. No one's got money. Like was the like sentiment. She was like, she was like, it's, it's difficult. And, and, but the thing is our show is about working class communities and low income communities. And part of why we chose Netflix was so that it could be as accessible as possible to those communities. And so there's also that layer of things of like, how can our shows get to people when sometimes the structures that are oppressing us are also keeping them from seeing the thing we're creating for them. So there's so many layers to that, that I feel like if there's a way to approach that within your own communities and, and support uh, that accessibility to people and spreading that word, I think that it would help to some degree. That's a great concrete um, answer. And, and yeah, I mean, I think that this just to, give my half a cent. Uh, I think that it's, it might sound like a cliche, but honestly, this, I don't think there has been a greater time for really like grassroots mobilization than ever. And, and a lot of that is because of the, you know, me technology of social media enabling that, you know, there really is the ability for the non-industry consumer to mobilize and to really eventize, you know, certain uh, certain things. And you saw that, I feel like I saw that for a year before Black Panther was released, you know, just this groundswell, uh, you know, generating excitement saying like, this is going to be a big freaking deal. Um, this is going to be a huge deal. Um, you saw that with Crazy Rich Asians and, and, and actually literally there was an organization that, um, you know, mobilized to buy out theaters, you know, you know, yes, buy your, buy a ticket yourself. If you can afford it by five, by 10, you know, get people, get your, get your parents to come out and watch it. Um, you know, the power of opening weekend, the power of, you know, like Linda was saying that first weekend that, that, um, the series drops, those are the things that, um, that govern the decisions, you know, to like, are we going to green light the next one? Um, there is an event movie with featuring uh, a completely Latino cast coming out this summer. You know, we're not paid by any of them, so we're going to name it. But, you know, you make that into an event and a celebration. It actually materially affects, you know, the following weekend, what, what gets greenlit and what, what sort of moves along the development process. Um, does anybody else want to add anything before I jump to our traditional question? Okay. Um, it's a tradition at Inform to ask all of the speakers the following question. What is your 60 second idea to change the world? I'm thrilled to ask this and not to answer this myself. I will start with Franklin. Yeah, this is not an easy question. Um, and I feel like any answer I give, I can immediately see the potential pitfalls to it. I've always had a theory that giving, that if you could find a way to give everyone uh, reliable access to the internet and a camera, um, you'd be able to do something very special. Um, and, and I think it, it stems from both my sort of obsession with film and television and the notion that if everybody can tell their stories, but everybody can have access to everybody else's stories, there's a level of sort of common recognition of humanity that you're able to create that sort of necessarily changes a lot of other interactions. Um, but I also just think, you know, access to information, um, we probably need to address the misinformation problem on the internet, but um, access to information, I think on a broad, on a broad scale uh, is always valuable. So yeah, final answer, but it'll probably be different if you ask me tomorrow. Sheldon? Yeah, and I guess I would frame this as a way of approaching difficult problems. And it's two thoughts. One is humility and the other one is intentionality. Uh, humility, and in this context, it's, you know, the problems we found were vast, deep, complex, intergenerational, you know, completely calcified. And then inten intentionality is really about the choices we make, right? So in this context, again, who do you hire? How much do you pay? How do you promote? What do you invest in? And doing those things choicefully, intentionally will lead to a lot of goodness, in film and TV, it's about, you know, more exciting projects, you know, more Black Panthers, more Parasites, more Crazy Rich Asians, and lots of value. So I would just say humility and intentionality. Hard question. I'm glad I went last. Um, for me, I, so many people who follow my, have followed my journey or watched my interviews or panels is, uh, will laugh, but uh, therapy. 
I have literally told my therapist, I think therapy will save the world because I mean, if it's accessible, I hope we can make it more accessible, but any type of personal development that forces you, not forces you, asks you (laughs) to develop a personal relationship with yourself, um, to understand yourself, to understand the way that you function in this world will not only like help you to be a better artist, but a better human. And whether you're, you know, black, Asian, Latino, Latinx, or, or, um, white, truthfully, like you, the, the macro way that we function as a society is just a reflection of the macro way we function with each other. So if I see you as less than human, I will function in an institution treating you and everyone around me in that way. But the more that I get to know myself, the more I can unpack for myself, what, what my, the oppression within me, the more I can take that out of myself, the more that I can lead from a place of kindness and love and understanding, the more I can set boundaries for myself, the more that you can set boundaries for you, the more that we're going to heal each other in this world. And the more content that's going to come out, that's actually positive and good. Like we're going to lead from a place that's not from the, what was it? The green, the green money. Nah, let's not lead from there. Let's let's lead from a better place. Let's lead from our hearts because that money will come, that abundance will come, but it'll be that much more as Franklin and Sheldon have both like just proven that much more when we lead from that place. And so that's, that's I think that'll change the world. Yeah. Well, those were very characteristically thoughtful answers and thoughtful solutions from all three of you. Uh, I'd like to thank Franklin, Sheldon, and Linda for joining me today at Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. Special thanks to McKinsey and Company for providing free access to today's program. And if you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. Once again, I'm Rebecca Sun. Thank you so much and stay safe. safe.